And it is so good to be here once again for a special night. What a way to kick off our homecoming festivities. And I know you're going to enjoy our program tonight. We're actually going to get started this evening with a special presentation. Um, Leslie Preeby, if you'll join me on stage, please. You know, high school coaching is a nomadic vocation for many. But really lucky schools get a great coach that comes along and then stays and establishes a legacy of excellence. And that's what Leslie Preeby has done at Waxhatchee High School. 28 years in coaching, 24 of those right here at WHS. And along that career, 523 career wins. Our teams were perennial playoff teams, of course, in the year 2000. We made our first trip to state with the girls basketball team, got all the way to the state championship game. And in 2006, and many of you were right there with us, and everybody going crazy when that girls team won that state title. Uh, in that special season, which by the way, that team and Coach Preview were inducted to this Athletic Hall of Fame just a few years ago in recognition of that honor. I'll say this, and I've said it publicly and privately, that uh, I was able to witness those 24 years. They went by awful fast, didn't they? Um, very few coaches consistently got the best out of their players in any sport like Leslie Preview did with the Lady Indians. We were so blessed and fortunate to have her here for a very quick 24 years. And our Athletic Hall of Fame, is upon her retirement, has decided we would like to make a special recognition. I told her we'll be inducting her here, I feel very uh, certain, before long. But we want to make a special presentation upon your retirement. Just for your years of excellence, thank you so much, Leslie. And, um, I think uh, the only thing you can say that makes any happier is if you decided maybe you'd come out of retirement at some point and, and, and decide to do more. Uh, Leslie Creepy, thank you so much. I just want to thank you for, for recognizing um, the years that I was able to be here in Waxahachie. And I've got to thank Jerry McLemore for giving me the opportunity to coach here at in this great town. Uh, I've always said that there's nothing like a one high school town and there's nothing like the fans here. And I just feel truly blessed from the bottom of my heart to have been able to be here that long. Thank you. Now we'll get started on our Athletic Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremony. We start off first with our Legends category. I'm gonna ask uh, Tom Borders to uh, make his way to the stage if he would. Uh, class of 1959 is the class that our first inductee graduated in and Tom is coming at this time to tell you about that special individual who is being inducted to our Athletic Hall of Fame in the Legends category. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to put the name of Margaret Howell Jr into the Legends category for the WHS uh, Athletics Hall of Fame. Margaret was a champion of mind, body, and spirit. Uh, for those of us who knew him, uh, that was very much aware, very, very quickly, how he fit into everything in Waxahachie. He, he was a, uh, an incredible athlete, but also a great student. And he was also a minister like his father. And one of the very first sermons that I remember back in preaching, he couldn't have been more than maybe 16. And the title of the sermon was How to Live a Happy Life. And it was based on uh, around a three-letter word, J-O-Y, joy. Those letters stood for Jesus, others, and yourself. And that has stuck with me for many, many years, and a lot of other people I'm sure that heard that take that with him every step they take. And I thank Margaret for those memories. He was not perfect, nor was I. When we, his sophomore year, when he moved from Temple to Waxahachie, we had a first period Latin class. We always had an assignment to interpret, you know, two or three pages of Latin. Second period, we had study hall. We had mandatory roll call at the start of study hall. Then you were free to go into the library. Well, we did that, and the librarian at that time was Miss Esther Bryant, who happened to have taught Latin for about 40 years before she became the librarian. 
And uh, she never did figure this out, but we would split the assignment and say, Miss Brian, I'm having trouble. Well, she would do our homework for us in just a matter of a few minutes. <laughs> we got by with that for that whole year. Well, the district superintendent of the Methodist Church, Parson, was right by the high school. And Margaret and I would sneak out. I don't know how many times we did this, and I'm sure God has long since forgiven us. I did check with legal counsel before deciding to say anything about this. <laughs> Statute of limitations expired long ago. <laughs> but we, we went to his mother's kitchen and got a great little dessert, got back in time for our third period class. Not once did we get caught. How? I don't know. I think it was because he was a man of the cloth, came out of a family of ministers, you know, that sort of thing. But the crowning moment, I think, was the first championship sports team that Wasatchee had in 1958. We were juniors. Well, Coach Williams knew Maggard and me well enough to not trust either one of us. And when we got to Austin, he had us swimming with him. Well, we didn't mind that. We loved Coach Williams. He was a great guy great leader. And I was late getting back to the hotel that afternoon, I was about five after one, and Maggard was laying on his bed crying. I said, Maggard, what is wrong with you? He said, you're being benched because you're late from curfew, and I've got to start in your place. I'm scared to death. <laughs> well, he started, we beat Herford in the semifinals, playing South San Antonio for the finals. Well, I got in three, three quick fouls there, fairly early in the game, and Maggard came off the bench to sub me, and in less than four minutes, he scored 12 points. And that was the spark and impetus that our team needed to put those guys aside. We beat them by 21 for our first state championship. And uh, Maggard uh, is just told me, so I know he's hearing every word of this, and we miss him. He was a wonderful person. And to accept his honor, I'm gonna ask his sister, Ruth Robbins, to come join me. And honor your, your younger brother, who is a wonderful person, and God tells him we love him. But I would like to say a few things about my hero. Maggard was uh, an incredibly uh, beautiful person. He was such a beacon of light in my life. And although we only had him on earth for 19 years, he taught us so much about life, about faith, about courage, about love. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into his life. He uh, loved sports. He played football, basketball, baseball, ran track, and he was a competitor. But most of all, he loved his teammates, and he loved his coaches. And I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of that love. Uh, first of all, uh, during football season, the sports writer for the Waxahachie Daily Lot was Ken Flagler. Is anybody here old enough to remember Ken? <laughs> anyway, uh, one day Ken came to my daddy's uh, office at the parsonage and said, Brother Howell, I just had to come and tell you something extraordinary about your son. And so Daddy's ears perked up, and this is the story that Ken Flagler told my dad. Maggard came to see me, and he said, Mr. Flagler, I really appreciate all the nice things you have written about me in the newspaper, but he said, I couldn't do anything without my teammates, and I would appreciate it if you would write less about me and more about my teammates that deserve the credit. Ken Flagler said, he was still in shock, he said, I had to come tell you this because I've never seen anything like this before. But Maggard loved his teammates, and he wanted them to get the credit that they deserved. Then, 1958, Waxahachie Indians basketball team, need I say more, but uh, that was the most thrilling season. I'm 80 years old, and I still get goosebumps whenever I think about that season, that 
uh, tournament in Austin and that Sunday afternoon celebration at the old high school gym. But I want to tell you about something that happened Sunday morning while the team was still in Austin. Tommy and uh, Magger and Mr. Williams roomed together. Now, don't you know that was an interesting situation? But uh, anyway, Tommy had already left, I think, and it was just Magger and Mr. Williams when the phone rang in the room, and Mr. Williams answered it, and he became very upset. And when uh, he hung up, uh, Magger said, Coach, I, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I couldn't help but overhear. It sounds like there's some kind of a problem uh, about the medals, to which Coach Williams uh, agreed. He said that was the representative from University Interscholastic League. And he was calling to tell me, we're sorry, but we don't have enough medals for all your players. We are short a medal. And of course, uh, Mr. Williams was so upset. Without blinking an eye, Maggart said, Coach, this is what we're going to do. Get a little box or container, and when you start handing out the medals this afternoon, when you get to my name, just present me with that empty box. And you and I are the only people that will ever know that that box is empty. Coach Williams said, oh, I can't do that. And Maggard said, Coach, let me tell you something. Playing, getting to play in this tournament is metal enough for me. And this is what I want us to do. And this is what we're going to do. How many times do you think Maggard or any other player talk like that to Mr. Williams? But anyway, uh, that afternoon, uh, when the medals were distributed, Magger got his little box and nobody knew that it was empty. Any of you who knew Coach J.W. Williams know that that was not the end of the story, right? The next day he got on the phone uh, to uh, the UIL people and uh, I would love to have heard that conversation, but bottom line, in a very short time, Maggard got his medal. Need I say more? He loved his coaches and he loved his players. And I just want to express to you what uh, an overwhelming joy this is for me. Uh, he was the best brother a girl could ever have and he meant so much to so many people uh, in every aspect of his life. Uh, when he was uh, injured uh, in next to the last game of his senior year, uh, he sustained a brain injury and was paralyzed on his left side. Uh, he had to learn to walk again. And uh, during that one year at SMU, when he could not play uh, and was recuperating from uh, the paralysis, uh, they had asked him to be a team manager, which uh, he loved doing. Uh, even though we knew it must hurt him uh, to watch the players and not be able to play. But I thank you for this tribute to him and for our family. We are extremely grateful to you. Next, we're going to ask Steve Harriman and Gary Fox to join us on stage. Our next inductee is a member of the athletes category and a, also a member of the class of 1970 of Waxahachie High School, and our presenters tonight are Steve Harriman and Gary Fox. Hope everybody's doing good this afternoon, and uh, it's an honor to be here to uh, uh, be able to say something about Phil Turner, uh, one of the finest athletes Waxahachie's ever known uh, in, in all things, especially baseball. And uh, I know you can read, but let me read this to you real quick because sometimes uh, uh, this doesn't, doesn't ever get out. And uh, it says, Phil Turner. Phil was a three-year letterman at Waukesha High School in basketball and baseball. In his junior year in basketball, 68-69, Phil was co-captain of the team and chosen for the second team. All this 
He received the J.W. Williams Team Spirit Award that year. In baseball his junior year, Phil was chosen all district, first team, and with a batting average of 456. Phil was captain of the basketball team his senior year. He received the Most Valuable Player Award and led the Indians in the most points scored for the year with a high scoring average of 18.5. Phil made first team all district and was a finalist for by district. He was third team all metro. His senior year of baseball, Phil was captain of the team. He was chosen as most valuable player from the district and was picked with the first team all district. The Indian Booster Club also chose Phil for the Most Valuable Baseball Player Award. Phil led the Indians with a 536 batting average in RBI. Phil continued his baseball career at TCU where he was a four-year letterman from 71 to 74. He was an anchor man for his team both offensively and defensively. He led his team with 47 hits in 1971. Phil was a team leader with a batting average of 388 and 38 RBIs in 73 and was named All-American at second base as well. He received the Rawlings Big Stick Award for leading hitter in a major college division. Phil continued to lead his team with 17 stolen bases in 1974. Phil was named to the all Salvage Conference team in 73 and 74. Phil's accomplishments in sports speak volumes. He doesn't like the attention, but his abilities on the baseball diamond and on the basketball court cause everyone to notice. However, Phil is the most humble athlete that has ever walked the earth one class bank stadium. He is a true leader, a hero, and an overall classy individual. His work ethic is seldom matched, and nobody can represent the Athletic Hall of Fame any better than Phil Turner. Now those are some good words right there. Not only the accomplishments that he's done, but also his character. And you know, some of the things that I wanted to tell you uh, basically is, is said in that little article there. You know, he was always humble. Always. And uh, from listening to the folks talking about Mr. Howell, always humble. Reckon that's a trait of very successful, happy, good people. It seems like that might be a trait for everybody concerned. Phil was always working hard. And, and the thing about Phil is he had his head down working and he wasn't looking around to see if anybody was watching. Now, how many people you know today that they want to do something good but they want everybody to see him do something good. Well, that wasn't him. And he's still out there. He works hard. He keeps his head and nose to the grindstone and doesn't care who sees him because he's doing a good job. And one thing that, that uh, I wanted to add is he has a happy spirit. You know, he's always smiling. He's, he's uh, very bashful acting. And uh, he is for the most part. Uh, one thing I wanted to let you know is that, you know, it didn't all start with Phil Turner. It started with his dad. And uh, that man was a fine fellow. And when I was a little boy, I was seven years old, he was uh, one of the baseball coaches on, on the team that I played for, which was Coca-Cola. And uh, his dad worked for Coca-Cola. And uh, after every, every game, you know, he would be there with a, a case of Coke for everybody to drink on our team, so we were special to get to play for Coca-Cola because we got something to drink after all the games. And uh, back in, uh, that was 1962, you know, that was always special right there. And uh, he was the same kind of guy. He worked hard, he didn't look around to see who was watching him work, he was just trying to do his job. And, and part of his job was to help rear the, the young athlete to walk the hatching, and he did a good job of that. You know, I always had an immense amount of respect for him, and it just trickled on down to his son. And uh, speaking of uh, the lady spoke of heaven a while ago, you know, uh, I guarantee his dad and mom are looking down, happy, because they've got two good sons. Now, you know, I can talk just as long about Mike Turner, but, you know, this is Phil's time. We're going to put him aside. This is Phil's time. But both fine people. And they, they've had a big part in my life. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, if you don't have anybody to look up to, look right over there. Phil Turner. He's a guy you can look up to. Uh, he, he sets a good example for people. 
Uh, when I was a kid uh, in uh, high school baseball, Coach Turner was the coach, and I always looked up to him, and Phil was a hero. You know, he was getting, he was doing all the great things, and uh, everybody watched him, because he was a hero, and still is. Uh, you know, I also got to work with Phil uh, when uh, my first year to teach school, I taught an one, and Phil was teaching that. He was the basketball coach there. And one thing that uh, he and I were notorious for is we were always late. Both of us. But it worked out good because the, the principal never knew who to be mad at because if I was there, you know, he was like, well, I wonder where Phil is. And I'm sure he would say, well, I wonder where Gary is. And so we kind of took up for each other and, and uh, eased the situation there. But we had a good time. Good time. I, you know, this day and time, uh, my son's a coach, and I know he enjoys it. But man, back in those days, it was fun. It was fun. And you had good people like Phil Turner to be with. So I won't say any more Steve going. Gary, would just sit down. This, 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 this one of the best friends I've ever had in life. And, and, and uh, we've worked, so I know he knows I can talk too much. But just wanted to let you know that in all the years that you had this program, you know, you're doing a great thing tonight by inducting Phil Turner. He doesn't want the attention, but he's ever been the, the kind of person you want in the Hall of Fame. Gary covered a lot of the statistics and, and all and, and covered it very well. Uh, I have a few other comments. Uh, Gary and I feel like uh, we play a role and we can flash back to the 60s and 70s when we were kind of in our prime. Uh, Gary and I were not the greatest athletes in the world, okay? I mean, we, our senior year in football, fall of 72, uh, it was a rebuilding year. We had a new coach. Um, it was, uh, we struggled through the year. But uh, matter of fact, our punter was the only one that had to ice anything down, and that was his leg after every game, okay? <laughs> Not the kicker, the punter, okay? So we feel like it's kind of our role here in Waxhatchee to make sure some of the folks that have come here since we left high school in 73 uh, to uh, call out to them uh, because a lot of those folks are, are, are the judges and the ones making the decisions and remind them of these folks who came before they even arrived here in Waxhatchee or before some of them were even born. Um, Gary has a saying, he calls us the Porter Wagner of Waxhatchee, okay? What, what he means by that is we didn't have much talent, but we knew how to discover talent, okay? So, you know, because Porter Wagner discovered uh, Mel Tillis and Marty Stewart and that little girl with the thin waist and big hair. Um, and uh, so I doubt when you left your homes tonight and came up here, you would think, well, Phil Turner's going to be compared to Dolly Part, okay? But... That's kind of what, that's kind of the role that we feel like we play. Uh, let's talk about uh, the first time I heard Phil's name, uh, I was in Farm League uh, down at Thomas Robinette Park, and I was playing second base, which is the worst position in the world. You had to work too hard there. Of course, that's what Phil played. And uh, we heard about this guy pitching for Coca-Cola up in the Little League. And he said, man, he'll wrap that curve around your neck. And he has a 12 to 6 curve. And, of course, we tend to exaggerate a little bit back and formally at Thomas Robinette Park. But uh, as it turns out, that was the first time I heard Phil's name. Uh, a lot of the comments tonight I'm going to make quickly are about basketball. He had, a, he had a great basketball career. And a lot of those comments are due to the conversations that Coach Rick Blythe and I have had over the last few years talking about who were the guys of the past that, uh, that, that we watched and he enjoyed coaching. And Phil was certainly one of those. Uh, Phil, between 68 and 1980, maybe along with David Jacobs, uh, those are two of the best guards that played for Walks at High in the basketball, uh, in the basketball gym. And they performed really well. Uh, during the two years that Phil played point guard for Coach Blythe, he combined both of those years. Of course, he was, uh, as Gary said, he was, uh, I think, second team his junior year, first team his senior year, uh, with those points, almost 20 points a game. But between the two years, 
Phil was the point guard for 44 wins for Coach Blythe's team. And Coach Blythe likes to tell the story, and of course I can remember it too. Uh, one of the, the, the pleasant memories that my parents and I sometimes talk about is going in 1970 to Moody Coliseum. Walks had you won the North Zone, of course Cannon won the South Zone. They were playing, they were reviving that old rivalry. This is 1970, and uh, Phil was phenomenal in that game. And one of the things he, he could do, he could drive that lane so effectively. And then, I don't know how many, we didn't talk about his assists, he had a tremendous amount of assists for the season, and certainly in that game he was spectacular. But one of the things that Coach Blythe reminded me of was the fact that Phil kind of perfected this play. When he'd drive the lane, he would stop short halfway up the lane, and with the extended big hands of the post player on defense, he would kind of push a little shot short into the basket halfway up the lane, which today, that was the first time Coach Blythe had ever seen that performed. And as a result, uh, we see it today in the NBA, they call it a pop shot. But Phil kind of perfected that back in, back in 1970. And the, the game at court with, up at Moody Coliseum at SMU against Corsicana was just uh, one of the best memories. Uh, Gary talked about his, his baseball career, and I think he covered that really well. Um, I, uh, I'd like to talk about the TCU thing a little bit in that Coach Frank Windegger, uh, he, uh, he, he, he loved Phil. Phil went up there, he started pretty much effectively uh, in his first year there, leadoff hitter, and um, he, um, he, he, he led it all four years. And Coach Windegger was a very successful coach. He was there 14 seasons from 62 to 75, and he had over 300 victories at TCU as a head coach. And he coached five All-Americans, okay? So he knew what a baseball player was. And he said, and it was quoted uh, last month when uh, Phil was inducted in the TCU Athletic Hall of Fame, Phil Turner was the purest his hitter I ever saw and ever coached. So that, that's, that's one of the best compliments you could ever offer uh, this fellow, this fellow that is a friend of mine. So I had the honor of being on the field, even though Phil got his Medicare card three years before I got mine. Um, I had the honor of being on the field with him a couple of times uh, when I was a freshman in high school. And um, he, he just, it was just a splendid uh, affair. Like you said, like Gary said, he was so humble and uh, such a joy to work with, always in position but not very vocal. He talked with his bat and his glove and his arm and his feet. And um, I know that, uh, uh, I'm just glad I never had to face that 12 to six curveball that he threw in, in Little League. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Waxahachie's All-American, Bill Turner. Thank you again, uh, Gary and Steve for the kind introduction and for all the help in the Hall of Fame nomination process that, that you got me into. I would also like to thank the WS Student Association and a special thank you to Terry Connors, uh, Paula Williams, and Terry Lewis. I would also like to thank the athletic director, uh, Greg Reed, and his staff and anybody else that has made this night possible. I would also like my family to stand up this time. Uh, so I thank you for your support. And a special thanks to my wife, Sherilyn. And I also like, I'd also, also like to thank everybody else that's been here tonight. There are, there are many people that are responsible for me standing here tonight. A role models, mentors, teachers, classmates, and teammates, coaches, and most of all, my parents. Without their total support for the many years, this, this night would not have been possible. I would also like to thank my, my teammates. Without their support, both on, on the court and field and all, this honor is as much as theirs 
is mine. To my coaches in basketball, Coach J.W. Williams, Coach Don Williams, and I, I would like to ask Coach Rick Bly to stand up at this time. I know, I, I know you're going through some health problems, and I thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you for making me a better basketball player. Under your guidance, and I also believe if we started pressing a little, little earlier, that, that we would beat Carthage in, in, our, in our own playoff game. Thanks again for everything. I guess I'll say the best for last, my baseball coach. Thank, th th thanks for being a great uh, baseball coach, mentor, and brother. W without your leadership, both on and off the field, this honor would not have been possible tonight. Thank you again. <laughs> that is so Mike Turner, if I, if I didn't, if I didn't mention his name. Uh, congratulations to all the other inductees. I'm very honored to be a part of the class of 2019 Hall of Fame inductees. Thanks again for the support for the night. And, and, and make this night so special for me and my family. Thank you again. We uh, have one more member of our present athlete class. Um, and we're going to ask Jerry McElmore, if he would, to, to uh, join us on stage at this time. Um, our uh, next recipient could not be with us tonight, but I understand is uh, going to join us through the means of technology. But Jerry McElmore will present our next inductee. I appreciate the opportunity tonight to present this uh, Hall of Fame award to David Hudson, class of 1984. Probably a great time for me also to thank the Hudson family. They uh, loaned me out three tailbacks in the, in the 80s that uh, made us a little better coaches than we really were. And it was a great time. We had David Hudson, 84, and then came along Gerald Hudson right after him that uh, went to OSU, led the nation in Russia, and then Kevin Hudson, Hudson, the youngest one, comes in and, and does a great job. So we had three great athletes. And, uh, uh, that was a great time for us, especially moving into the I formation and tailbacks being the focal point of that. And we are lucky enough to walk at you to have that type of athlete running around and made a difference. Uh, David Hudson has great stats, but I think uh, as you read the things from a lot of his classmates that they wrote in the referral for this award, uh, he was even a greater person. David Hudson was one of the finest kids that I ever had the opportunity to coach. And I, I took some things out of the, the classmates, the different things that they related to David was that he was respectful, humble, team player, hard worker, competitor, a gentleman on the field, <clears throat> mentor for all the uh, classmates, and a gentle giant. And David was about 6'2", 230, and of course back in the 80s, uh, he was bigger than most of our line. And, uh, of course, a lot of y'all in this room remember we used to play with 150 and 60-pound uh, linemen in the day. But things have changed. Uh, the teammates compared David to Earl Campbell and Jim Brown, and I agree. He had those type of qualities. He was uh, given the nickname of Quarter Horse. Uh, he played in that fashion as a quarter horse, although he could be a plow horse when he needed to be, so he could do a lot of different things. I know this is in the booklet, but just some quick stats on David. Basically, he won the state championship in the shot put in 1984 and uh, threw 52 feet. And Coach Bowman was uh, instrumental in that win along with David. And that's an unusual feat for a kid that's a tailback in football to win the shot put. Uh, David, uh, in 1982, he had the uh, 17th most yards rushing for a 4A a tailback. And then in 83, he had the sixth most yards rushing as a 4A tailback. And I read in a deal from Vance Hines on his deal that uh, Thurman Thomas was playing at Willow Ridge at that time, and David beat him by 20 yards. And I know a lot of y'all know who Thurman Thomas is, so that's quite a feat. David was All-State, All-Conference, Team MVP, and Captain in 84 or 83. 
I got a full scholarship at Iowa and had many offers. Uh, one of the few kids that we ever had from this area that went up in the, into that area to play, you know, the weather's cold and they played a different offense and ball control and David fit right into that program as a fullback and played in four bowl games. Uh, I'll never forget hearing his name mentioned in the Rose Bowl, playing fullback, uh, uh, really exciting times. <clears throat> he scored, a, started four years for Hayden Fry at Iowa, scored 25 touchdowns, 1,500 yards. Uh, he perceived 464 yards receiving. After I read that, I thought, we never threw one pass to David. I said, boy, we were a little on the stupid side. <laughs> and apparently he could do it, but I didn't know that, so time changed in the offense. Uh, earned many offensive boards there. Uh, David remained in Iowa to this day, and that's why he's not here tonight. He stayed there and worked for the same company for 25 years and <clears throat> has two children that are raised and often adults and then has a granddaughter. So David's doing extremely well. So I'd like to welcome David to the High School Hall of Fame tonight. And uh, I think David has sent a little video here about that. And so I'll accept the award for him and we'll look at it. This Hi, my name is Dave Hudson from class of 84. I would like to thank all the board members for voting me in to the Hall of Fame. Very appreciative. Couldn't have made it without the support of my team and teammates to Thanks to Coach J Mack and the coaching staff, offensive line that did all the blocking, along with Tony Reddick. Very appreciative of it. Uh, if there's anybody I forgot, please forgive me. It's been quite a long time. So, uh, man, a few words. Thanks again. Uh, make it to our friends category next on our Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Just, uh, inductee who also happens to uh, have been a member of the class of 1963 at Waxhatchee High School and Chris will tell you more about our next inductee. Hey there, thank you. Uh, first of all, I do want to say thank you to the um, ex Students Association for this, uh, for the honor and thank you to uh, Brian Zettler, I believe he's the one that actually submitted the, um, the form uh, shortly after mom died. Uh, to get her in this um, in the hall, so thank you. Um, in the program, it uh, refers to mom as a fanatic, and uh, that's truly what she was. She was a Waxahachie athletic fanatic. Uh, so much so that uh, pretty much at basketball games, dad refused to sit with her. <laughs> he would have to sit a few rows back and over because whenever he would, whenever mom would raise the eye at the officials, he'd want to be around to. Uh, to get that as well, so, but um, uh, seriously, thank you guys. Um, of course, Mom's not here physically. Uh, she is here in spirit. Um, if she were here, she would have the biggest smile on her face uh, for this honor, so thank you guys. Um, I wanna bring up my sister, uh, Tracy, um, to uh, say a few words too about Mom, so thank you very much. Like you said, uh, this is just such an honor um, for Peggy to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Um, she continued to support the Indians even after she graduated. Um, I know she would have been so happy to be here uh, to actually accept this award. Um, Peggy has watched and supported many athletes at the high school. Young men, young women, and many great coaches as well. Okay. She also supported them even as they went off to college. I remember her loading up the Suburban. We would drive to Waco and watch Jeff Stearns play, uh, play basketball. And um, Jeff Wallace was on the team too. <laughs> and so, but we would load his mother up, XC May, we'd go up there and pick her up. She would get in that suburban, we'd take her to Waco for the game. We went to several games. Um, we went to 
Many, we had many road trips down to Austin, watched many basketball games, volleyball games, um, baseball, can't forget baseball. Um, she just enjoyed it. She loved meet, meet, meeting these guys and these girls, and she just opened her heart and her home to them. She would cook Sunday dinners and invite them over. She would go pick them up on Sunday afternoon and say, come on, you're coming to my house. I'm going to fix lunch and you're going to eat lunch and talk about the game or whatever. So um, she just loved it. And I'm so glad she did because she gave me the love for sports. And to this day, I still love sports. I love going to the games. I love seeing the young kids. So um, it's just a blessing. It is sad that she's not here tonight, but I know that she's watching in heaven and she's smiling down. So um, my family and I would like to thank <laughs> I know that um, I would like to thank Brian Zettler and the Ex Students Association for voting Peggy in to the Hall of Fame. Um, we appreciate this so much, and I know she does too. One thank of the things that makes Wauwatosa Athletics special is the folks who do continue to support the teams even after their kids are out of school and. Uh, I can remember many a time uh, after a ball game that Peggy would come up and catch us as we were leaving the ballpark and said, did you, did y'all tell everybody what a horrible call that was? Or, and BJ would just be standing behind her shaking his head. No, you know, but you could count on them. You could count on them being there. And that, that uh, certainly is why Peggy is so deserving of this induction ceremony tonight in her place and the Athletic Hall of Fame. Next up on our Friends category induction ceremony, uh, Terry Connor comes to make a presentation of a gentleman that certainly was instrumental in a lot of young lives in Waxahachie. He was also a member of the class of 1938. Terry? Uh, and before I start with, uh, with what I'm going to say uh, about, about uh, our next pre uh, honoree, it's about time. It's been a long time coming for this inductee. Should have been in a long time ago. James Hosford, it sounds a little unusual. And the reason being is everybody knew him as Buddy Hosford. If you grew up in Waxahachie in the 50s, 60s, and 70s and played sports as a youth, played high school sports, walked his mail route with him, even sat on Coke boxes at Roy Cloth's and ate hamburgers with him. Buddy is probably one of the first names that comes to mind to everybody when you talk and think of terms and friends of athletics in Walks Edge High School. He was always there to help. He was there for the, helping the youth of, of the community. If you didn't have proper equipment, Buddy made sure of it. If you needed the money to join the teams, Buddy was there to help. Although he and his wife, Gwen, did not have any children of their own, it can be argued that they had hundreds of kids. They took kids on summer trips after our Little League season. They just supported all those young, young athletes. Buddy was a Pee Wee football coach, Little League football coach, American Legion baseball coach, and was, he was also the president of the Indian Booster Club. And at that time, the Indian Booster Club was an all-inclusive club of all sports in WHS. At the end of each year, Buddy set up the all-sports banquet. And again, that was 
a banquet that held for all athletics uh, in WHS. Every child, many adults looked up to Buddy for his leadership and guidance. He led by example. Never once did I hear a crossword come from him in any situation. Buddy was a role model's model. I want to share with you some of the things that some of the, the people that wrote in to, to nominate Buddy for this, some of the, from some of his kids. One writes, you can't mention friend of athletics in Waxahachie without including Buddy Hosford. Buddy was not only a great coach, but was even a greater role model. There's that word again. Another writes, Buddy Hosford was one of those role models, again, and community leaders who lived the best life of example and virtue. Buddy should, should be inducted because of his devotion to all athletic programs in Waxahachie. He was especially devoted to the youth both on and off the field and impacted many young men in, in their daily lives, writes another. One last one. He was always patient and kind yet firm. He taught by example and always made sure that there was some time for fun. I'm sure you went through, the, if you go through this room, many of the folks here would tell you the same thing. And I'm sure he impacted many of our lives that are set here today. I could go on and on and on, but I'm not uh, Mr. Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I had a, a great envy and respect for Buddy. In his obituary, it was listed as survived by his son by choice, not by blood. And here to accept that the Hall of Fame honor is his son by choice, not by blood, Mr. Gary Bissou. I think you'll find that I'll repeat several things that Terry just mentioned tonight. All of them are very true to what he said. Uh, first of all, though, I'd like to extend my sincere congratulations to the other inductees and award recipients tonight. Your achievements are very impressive, and to be a part of the elite group such as this is quite an honor. I would also like to thank a lot of my former classmates, many of which are here tonight, along with several other individuals from other classes that were greatly influenced by Buddy and who wrote letters and sent emails to help promote him for this special award. However, I think most of us recognize that this took the effort and enthusiastic involvement of someone special to get Buddy's recognition across the finish line. And to Terry Connor, we say thank you. Job well done, my friend. I'd like to add that this was not the first attempt to, to, to have Buddy inducted as a friend to the Athletic Hall of Fame. Steve Harriman was one of Buddy's favorites during Steve's Little League years and all the way through high school. Steve knows as much or more than anyone about how deserving Buddy is of this award. Shortly after Buddy's death in 2014, Steve wrote a wonderful, lengthy, in-depth letter of recommendation describing Buddy's involvement and generosity with the youth of Waxahachie. Unfortunately, he was not chosen for this award at that time. I know this is a happy night for you, Steve, although it took a little bit longer than we had hoped. And while I'm at it, I'd also like to briefly mention a letter to the editor that was written by Glenn Perryman, also shortly after Buddy's death. Glenn, I don't know if you're here tonight, but you did an excellent job with your heartfelt comments about Buddy. The last sentence that Glenn wrote in that letter was very special. There are a lot of good citizens in this world because of Buddy's influence. When he left this world, he took a little piece of us with him, but he also left a lot of himself with us. So true. Great job, Glenn. Before I go any further, I'd like to mention Buddy's wife, Gwen. Gwen, I know that Buddy 
I know the buddy would want us all to include her as being a huge part of this award. Back in the Little League and high school days, Gwen made many sacrifices which allowed Buddy to spend so much time with the kids at games, practices, or other endeavors. But she was always supporting him and the players and took part in most of the baseball, football, and other functions. She really enjoyed watching the kids play and was one of our most enthusiastic supporters. Buddy and Gwen were a team, married 50 years, and I, and I hope we all agree that Gwen is very deserving as a co-recipient of this award. Now, I would like to briefly acknowledge that, although most of us here knew Buddy very well, there are some here tonight that did not know him. So I'd like to mention just a few things that to hopefully give you a better understanding as to why this man was so special and loved by so many people and so deserving of this award. But he was born November 13, 1920 in Starrett and attended Waxahachie High School and then Trinity University where he excelled in football and later at SMU. He was employed as a postal carrier in Waxahachie and later a rural carrier in Red Oak until his retirement. He belonged to the Lions Club, which sponsored the Little League and Pee Wee football teams, which he coached or managed for approximately 20 years. He also helped establish the punt, pass, and kick programs in Waxahachie, along with the Junior Olympics. I think that most of the kids that grew up with Buddy first met him when we were fortunate enough to be picked to be on his Little League or Pee Wee football teams. We learned very quickly that being a part of, of his team required a commitment. And there were consequences if you did not follow his rules. We learned also that Buddy was a fierce competitor. But as a coach, he taught us to always display good character and practice good sportsmanship. He was constantly teaching and never accepted a slacker. He was a perfectionist in a lot of ways and demanding as a coach, but his competitive nature and temperament with, and he was tempered with a tremendous patience and a down-to-earth, humble style with a very special sense of humor and a quick wit that enabled him to connect with kids. I'd like to, to list just a few of the memories that most of these players probably think about. I know that I do still when reminiscing about being on Buddy's team back then. Being treated to a cold mug of root beer on a summer night after a Little League game, with some, which sometimes included a hamburger after a big win. It was paid for by Buddy, of course. Summer trips to Austin, San Antonio, Carlsbad Caverns, and the Astrodome. Also, Roaring River, Missouri, one year when one of our teammates, Pete Condick was his name, moved to Roaring River, Missouri, and so the team loaded up and went to see him. Pretty special. Frequent trips to Glen Rose to swim in the river or the big pool at the cabins where we stayed overnight. Riding home after games and practices in the back of Buddy's pickup or fighting for a spot up front in the cab. He would gladly give everyone a ride, even if the parents were at the game. And of course, walking the mail route. This was a common sight during the summer, summer days back then, kids tagging along with Buddy. A big part of his life back then was perfectly illustrated by Pat Sawyer when she wrote a poem about him simply entitled Buddy, and which ran in the daily light. A framed copy was presented to him and Gwen in 1968 at the Pee Wee football banquet. It described a typical day in Buddy's life and how the kids felt about him, how generous he was, and how he would sometimes use his own money to furnish equipment. He would always be there for kids in need. It mentioned how he would raise money by doing extra jobs, for the Dow and delivering papers for the Dallas Morning News, which he did 
early mornings for many years, or collecting papers locally and delivering them to Dallas for recycling. I considered the poem so special that I included it on the memorial program at Betty's funeral. Thank you, Mrs. Sawyer. I feel sure that your poem had more of an impact than you could have ever imagined. But during the, the 60s and 70s, but in Gwen's involvement with the youth of Waxahachie did not end with Pee Wee football or Little League baseball. As most of us know, he was just as involved with the high school kids, but not in a coaching capacity. Several examples are as follows. He and Gwen would volunteer to provide transportation whenever needed, especially for the cheerleaders for the out-of-town games. But he would often serve as the timekeeper of the game clock at basketball games and the official scorekeeper at baseball games. They both would often be the official chaperones at the dances after home games. But he would be responsible for building and guarding the annual bonfire at homecoming each year, hauling tables and chairs like Terry mentioned and setting them up in the annual athletic and other banquets attending every football, basketball, or baseball game played, along with volunteering at every opportunity. His efforts were so appreciated that the 1962 Waxahachie High School Annual was dedicated to him for his contributions and involvement with students and school activities. I'm not aware that this award had been given to anyone not employed with the school prior to that time. He was truly a pillar of the community. Some of the other awards and leadership roles during those years include State Chairman of the American Legion in 1977 and during the association with the American Legion, he was responsible for bringing four state tournaments to Waxahachie. He was selected as Outstanding Legionnaire of the local post in 1968. He and Gwen were renamed Outstanding Citizens of Waxahachie by the local Chamber of Commerce in 1964. He was twice named Indian Booster of the Year. In 1971, he was honored for his work by Pee Wee Commissioners. But he was so many things to so many people. But if asked to describe him in two words, I would probably say Proud American. He was truly a patriot. Having served in the service with his 18th CB Battalion in World War II, when he made lifelong friendships, he and Gwen helped start an annual reunion, which he attended with a record of perfect attendance for 58 years. I attended several of these and was always inspired by the character of these veterans and how they all had such deep respect for one another. When it was time to say goodbye, it was pretty obvious to me who the favorite was, as there were not many who said goodbye to Buddy who could keep from tearing up as he hugged each other and shared their farewells. As most of us know, Buddy had many endearing characteristics and will always be remembered for his kindness, generosity, work ethic, which was second to none, and special sense of humor. But most of all, his most impressive trait to me was his humble nature. He spent most of his life working tirelessly for the benefit of others, the first to promote someone else, but the last to accept any thanks or recognition in return. He was undeniably the best that he could be day in and day out, while every minute being the ideal role model and providing the perfect example to kids like me every step of the way. He was a true Southern gentleman with tremendous integrity and a finer man I'll never know. On a personal note, I thank the good Lord many times for his, this man's personal attention to me. But it was not only my good fortune, but the entire communities when he decided early in life to share with us his most valuable and treasured possession, his time. 
It's such an honor for me to be here tonight to receive this award as a friend of athletics. I sincerely thank the Waxahachie High School Lake Students Association and proudly accept on Lenny Wynn's behalf. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.